Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. It basically tells us that uh, our thoughts define us. And uh, Jesus says the same in uh, Mark 7 verse 15 through and 16. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, it's not um, what we eat or uh, what we absorb uh, through our senses, but it's what we think. So the question is, what do we think? And um, we could maybe specify it first by saying, what do we think of ourselves? Because even though we are what we think, we are not always what we think we are. We must change the way we think of ourselves. And uh, Romans 12 verse uh, 3 um, puts it uh, like this. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. We must think soberly. And that is not with pride. We spoke about this the other time. It also doesn't mean necessarily that we have to think little of ourselves, but we have to think realistic. On one hand, we are kings and uh, priests in God's kingdom. But on the other hand, we have sin nature and we can do nothing without Jesus. One of the most important uh, things that we do all the time is think. And our thinking it can be profitable. Uh, it can be also futile, or to the other side of the spectrum, it can be destructive. And thus we must master our thoughts. We can think good or we can think evil. Um, that's a choice, that's our choice. But we cannot do both. We cannot think good and evil, both. It's like trying to walk on the left side and the right side of the road at the same time. It's impossible. We must choose. It's either all good or it is all bad. And it, I word it like this on purpose. All good or all bad. It cannot be almost all good and a little bit bad. Then it's all bad. It, it's one or the other. It's either clean or it's unclean. It's either moral or it's immoral. It's either pure or impure, just or unjust, righteous or unrighteous, uh, honest, dishonest. It's true or false. It's good or bad. And these thoughts spring from the heart. The fir first verse I read, Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, it springs from the heart. And we see in scripture how heart and mind are linked. We wouldn't um, perceive it like that because in our um, idea, thoughts come from the mind, from the head. Um, and maybe biologically uh, there is uh, truth to that, but um, if we see it from the biblical perspective, we see that there is a difference in the mind and the heart in the sense that the mind is the intellectual uh, part where we can weigh things and, and see, think about what, uh, uh, what is good and what not, how should we express ourselves uh, so that um, it's to our advantage or not to expose ourselves or whatever uh, motive there may be. Um, but the heart is what we really are. And so these thoughts that come from the heart, they express what we actually really are without... Um, without uh, filtering or uh, masquerading them. And um, even in Hebrew, these two are a linked, the heart and the mind, because they together make up uh, our, our totality. It's also why Jesus says, uh, Love the Lord uh, your God with all your heart, your soul and your mind. 
Uh, in Hebrew, uh, heart and mind is the same word. Uh, it's left, uh, this word. And Jeremiah says about this in uh, chapter 17, verse 9, uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So that means we have to be very careful now. Uh, so as we choose our thoughts, as we master our minds, we must also work on what's in our hearts. This is actually uh, the source of it. And James writes in James 4 verse 8, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, O ye sinners. That's the outside, where you do the work with. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. So, cleansing your hands, purifying the outside is not enough. You have to purify the heart. That's the source where it all comes from. And he leaves and links it then to double-mindedness. So you see again the link between the heart and the mind. Now the question can be, uh, should be actually, uh, how do we renew our heart? How do we purify our heart? And uh, Psalm 119 gives us uh, some answer to that. Um, in verse 11, it says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. So how do I not sin? How do I, uh, do I uh, uh, live according to God's will? By having his word hidden in my heart. We have to have God's word hidden in our hearts and in our minds. So that we guard ourselves from sinning against God. That is what the verse says. And you see it's in our hearts, not just in our minds. We can memorize the whole Bible, but if it's not in our heart, it won't help us um, in the end, we have to have it in our heart. Then we, in word and deed, we will uh, prevent ourselves from sinning against God. So, we have to understand that we always sin in thought first, before we sin in deed. And Jesus said about this in Matthew 15, verse 18 and 19, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man, for out of the heart proceeded evil thoughts. So the evil thoughts do not begin in the mind. They do not begin intellectually. They come from the heart, from, the, from, from who we really are. And it's that sinful nature that feeds these thoughts. And then it comes out. Then it will turn into deeds and eventually lead to death. A thief is a thief because he thinks like a thief. And he decides to steal based on those thoughts. And a liar is a liar because he thinks like a liar. And as a result, um, he lies. And he thinks of this and he lies. So, it's great wisdom what Solomon writes. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So, the question is, when we realize this, how do we... How do we get out of this? And of course, it's partially answered already. But um, let's go a bit deeper. Verse uh, 7 of Isaiah 55 tells us um, something more about this. It says, I let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So, it says here, let the wicked forsake his way. This is a verb. Forsake means to leave or to refuse. And then means you leave one thing, you go towards something else. You change direction. And that is also what it says there, return to the Lord. Return, uh, it's this, in Hebrew, this word, um, teshuva, eh? which is repent. It means to, to, to change in a, to a different direction. So we must refuse unrighteous thoughts, that's what it says here also, and, and the reason why, because they will lead us to unrighteous ways. So you have the thoughts and you have the ways, uh, and by forsaking the thoughts we will not go in these ways, unrighteous ways. Now as I said, there are two ways of thinking, is there right? 
the, or the righteous, I should say, and the unrighteous. Um, as uh, Jesus says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. You cannot live a righteous life and um, think unrighteous. You may be able to act this out for a while, but uh, you will fail in the end. It will, uh, it will be exposed. Um, and James writes, no spring yields both fresh water uh, or salt water and fresh. It's either one or the other. But you can forsake unrighteous thoughts. They may come because of your wicked heart. And actually, I, I dare to say they, they will come. But the, the, the thing to do at that point is to forsake them, to to. Um, to leave them, to turn away from them, to refuse them, and um, and turn or return to God, and He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, as John writes. So, thoughts lead to actions, and that's why they must be captured. And God makes this principle very clear that thoughts leads to actions when he describes his own thoughts. And that's in the next verses, actually, in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. It says there, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So you have here, um, four times the word uh, thoughts and uh, four times the word ways. Thoughts lead to ways. God's thoughts lead to, to God's ways. Our thoughts lead to our ways. And that means that thoughts do not stay thoughts. Uh, thoughts carry purpose and intention. And they lead to ways. And ways imply action, direction. Now you're going somewhere with these thoughts. You're going to do something with these thoughts. It becomes action. And so, therefore, you have to be at the source, which is where the thoughts spring from. That's the heart. Uh, if we don't fix that, uh, rather, if we don't allow God to fix that, then um, we, will, uh, we will not get out of this. When we think unrighteous thoughts, our purposes and our intentions are wrong. And it will lead us in the wrong direction. It will lead to a life in opposition to God. The wrong direction is the, the direction away from God. And so that's always where it results. So how do we do that? How do we capture our thoughts? How do we think righteous? How do we master our mind? Or how do we renew our mind? We answered it already, actually, from the verse I read from Psalm 119. And further down in the same psalm, um, it comes back to the same thing, um, but with different words. It says in uh, verse 97, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Now, it speaks to you about the law, the word of God. This is also what it said in the verse I read before. Um, and then it speaks about meditation. Now, when we think of the word meditate, we may think of someone uh, sitting uh, with, uh, with his legs crossed and uh, eyes closed and um, yeah, basically thinking of nothing, eh? like in yoga. And uh, it says here, meditate all the day. So if we would do that all the day, it would ba basically uh, yeah, render someone completely passive the whole day. And that is, of course, not what uh, the way we should be. To meditate, and we find the word several times in the scripture, um, it simply means refined thinking, focusing your thoughts. Concentrating on a certain idea or topic. Specifically concentrating, focused on a certain idea or topic, a uh, piece of scripture that you read. And that can indeed be done throughout the day. And you see it's the, the polar opposite of what many think that meditation is like. Uh, 
uh, emptying your mind, yeah? relaxing your mind, thinking of nothing. That's wrong because then um, actually you allow other things to come in. No, you have to be focused on, on a specific topic. And that here, of course, pertains to the law. It says, how I love your law. I love your word, your instruction. And so that's what you focus on. That's a choice. Uh, and that's choice every time again, every moment of the day, every day. Um, but we have to do it. And, um, it does not go by itself. It's something that God will automatically do this and we will somehow automatically turn into this mode. But it is not so. We have to actively work on this. It would be nice, of course, if we, we could just uh, throw all our unrighteous thoughts into the garbage can and get rid of it. But uh, it doesn't work that uh, way. It's not that easy. It requires action. Certainly not passiveness. And uh, this is also made clear in 1 Peter uh, 1 verse 13. Uh, Peter writes there, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end of for the grace that is to be brought upon, uh, unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I have said many times, always take notice of the verbs. This is what, what you must do. Uh, and he says here, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. That's what you have to do. Now, gird up the loins of your mind. It's, it's girding up of the loins is an Old Testament um, picture um, that has to do with the, the garments uh, that they used to wear in, in the, this, uh, the biblical times in the Middle East, and they still do, by the way, in those uh, areas of the world. Long garments um, are good coverage, but when you have to move fast, when you have to run, you can imagine that it's easy to stumble and fall. And so when you have to move fast, you have to gird up these, uh, these uh, garments, which means you, you pull them up and you bind them under your uh, belt um, so that they don't bother you when you have to run. That's the, the picture here. And um, just f for the sake of illustration, I will read two verses from the Old Testament where we find this. One is from Exodus 12, where the Israelites um, have to leave Egypt and they have to be in a hurry. And so to, um, to make this clear, God gives this instruction in verse 11. And thus shall ye, shall ye eat it, speaking about the Passover lamb, with your loins girded and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So here you see it, it says literally you have to be ready to be in a hurry, in haste. Your shoes on, your staff in your hand, and your loins girded. And another example well known is from uh, 1 Kings 18, verse 46, speaking about Elijah. The hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So that is the, the idea, and this is not something we need to do literal, literally, um, but uh, of course it speaks here about spiritual sense. We gird up the loins. We, in other words, we take away the obstacles that will make us stumble and fall. Uh, we, we put them aside, we gird them up so that we can move fast and in the right direction. We capture our thoughts. That's a deliberate and conscientious action and we must perform it every moment of the day. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. He says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ bringing into captivity. You, you take these thoughts and then you purge them, you, you refuse them. That is what it means also to meditate. You focus on a specific thing, uh, on, on the Word of God, on the instruction and the law of God, and therefore you refuse all the other things. It's focused. Eh? And focus means exactly that. You focus on one point so that you are refusing and not taking, paying attention basically to the other things. It's not clearing your mind, but it is actually focusing your mind. It's really the opposite. 
uh, on God's word. And apply that, of course. The thoughts lead to ways. And we do that all day long. And if we do that, there is really little time and little desire left for unrighteous thoughts. Maybe to illustrate it even in another way or make it more practical, because I like for things to be practical, you can actually um, use it. Jesus says in John 14, uh, verse 15, If you love me, you keep my commandments. And of course that um, pertains all of his word, but it boils down eventually to the Ten Commandments. So we can we can say, uh, or summarize that with... Um, with the number 10 pertaining to, to the law, um, the Ten Commandments. So that is a definition of the do's and the don'ts that we, uh, we have. And that sets boundaries. These are not boundaries to limit us, to make our life difficult or even miserable. But these are boundaries for protection. If you stay inside these boundaries, you're protected. You are basically in the will of God. In the right in the next verse in John 14, Jesus links that to receiving the Holy Spirit. He says, if you do that, then I will pray the Father uh, that you will, may receive um, the, uh, the comfort of the Spirit of truth. And once God's Spirit enters you, indwells you, your nature begins to change. The way you think begins to change because now the, th the thoughts that you get are not the thoughts of your heart, they are the thoughts of the Holy Spirit that lives in you. The purpose of, uh, of the heart, the, the thoughts of the heart, our, our nature, is to serve self. And the purpose of this Holy Spirit is to serve God. So it helps us to serve God. That is uh, what happens. Our nature changes. And um, Paul, um, in Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23, summarizes the characteristic of this, of this spirit, uh, how it uh, begins to characterize our nature in nine uh, elements, uh, nine characteristics, uh, often called the fruit of the spirit. So that's, uh, that's um, how we go from, from the instruction to the nature. So this is the, the instruction is basically, you can say, the theory, the, um, the knowledge. You can learn them by heart. That's just knowledge. But when you truly love Jesus and apply them, ap apply them, yeah, these, these laws, these instructions of God, out of love for him, that's what he says. If you love me, you keep my commandments. Then the nature begins to change. Now it begins to have effect. Now it begins to influence our ways. And that is going to define our actions. Um, no longer is the thoughts that spring from the heart. Yeah? As he thinks in his heart, so is he. No longer this. But now as the spirit leads, so is he. Now it, it becomes a whole different paradigm. And uh, Paul, again, uh, summarizes the things that we will um, do, our ways, our actions, um, by giving them eight um, characteristics, eight labels, if you will, um, that apply to them. So, uh, that's then the next number. Eight. That comes up next, and uh, that we can find, uh, by the way, in Philippians 4, verse 8. Um, let's read that. It says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are uh, true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So, eight things. And basically, actually... Uh, if you cannot attach these labels to the things that you are occupied with, um, whatever it may be, it can be in your work, it can be when you watch a movie uh, or um, when you are with friends or whatever it may be. If you cannot attach these labels to that activity, then actually you're not involved with the right activity. It's a very good way to test 
um, um, yeah, whether what you are involved with is, is, is the right thing. So we have uh, the knowledge, that's ten, eh, the law. We have the nature, the new nature, that's the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, that's nine, uh, nine characteristics. And then you have the actions, the behavior, the ways, and that is um, uh, here represented with the number eight, nine, ten, nine, eight. So it's just a practical way to remember these things and also to apply it. Because often um, yeah, we see all these beautiful verses and we have this nice uh, explanation maybe or teaching, but then in the end you are, you know, what do I do now? How do I do it? And so um, try to make it practical this way. So to summarize uh, maybe um, in a different way, what do we do? We choose. We have to make a choice, and that is something each one of us has to do for him or herself. Uh, the choice is not um, not forced upon you. So we have to make a, cho a choice. Uh, that it means repent, yeah? teshuva, change direction. That's actually 180 degrees different direction, change of heart. When we make this choice. We will seek God, and we will seek God uh, for an important part through His Word. By reading His Word, by being in His Word, we have to absorb it, we have to make it our own. Uh, we cannot uh, know God without knowing His Word, and that's both, of course, the written and the living Word. So that's one thing we do. Then we forsake unrighteousness. Because when we, the more we read the word, the more we get to know God's character and God's ways, we also begin to see how wrong our ways are, and we have to begin forsake them. If we cannot see what is good or wrong, then we cannot make that, that uh, choice. So we choose, uh, repent, we seek God's word, we forsake unrighteousness, we take our thoughts into captivity. Now we forsake these, these thoughts. We refuse them and we fill our mind with other thoughts. We meditate on God's word. And we do this not as some um, exercise. We do this because we love Jesus. And I said it also recently uh, to, to someone. Faith is it's not um, a belief system. It's not a, a mindset. Faith is a relationship. It's a living relationship with Jesus. And so if it's not a, a relationship with a person of Jesus, then it's theory. It's, it's not a life. This is not uh, the, the faith that, uh, that uh, leads to salvation and uh, leads us into the kingdom of God. It has to be a living relationship. And if you have a relationship with anyone, whether it's your, your spouse or with children or um, you have a relationship with colleagues, with people around you, you interact with them. You like to hear from them, you like to speak to them, you like to do things together. That is what a relationship means. And so it's the same, uh, but of course on a deeper level with our relationship with Jesus. If it's a real relationship, we want to hear from him and read from him. We want to speak to him. We want to, to do things with him, which means we involve him in the things that we do or the things that he leads us to. It has to be a living relationship. And then um, we will see that we actually truly begin to live because before that we are actually dead. So, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Let our heart be filled with the Holy Spirit, and we will um, see true life.